You're watching the Chris Massey Music Show. And by the way, I'm Johnny Van Zandt of Leonard Skinner. Welcome to the Chris Massey Show here on the American Hearts Radio Network. We appreciate you tuning in with us at this uh, late hour. Uh, Al had a gig with the uh, SOS band up in Minneapolis and was not able to get back in time for our regular 745 slot. We were scheduled to go on at 1015 and we had a little power problem here. And uh, anyway, it's real good to be in here in this cozy uh, studio because it is nasty outside tonight. Again, thanks, uh, thanks for watching. Now, since the last time we were on the air, our good friend Mitt Romney announced that he is not running for president of the United States of America. Did you hear that, Al? Yeah. He is not running. Uh, Mitt was, uh, Mitt said that he was going to give another Republican the opportunity to get their ass kicked in 2016. I think that's awful nice of Mitt. Uh, off camera, though, people said that he could be heard kicking and screaming and pitching a fit, saying, God damn it, I have more money than anybody. Why can't I be president? So, Jeb Bush is in, has got his uh, hat in the ring, too. And I tell you what, two days ago in an interview, when asked about his brother George, Jeb said that George was a fantastic president. Well, you can scratch him off the ballot right now. I mean, it's hard to believe that somebody would actually come out and say something like that, even if he is your own brother. I mean, the man left office with a 22% approval rating. And for those of you who are wondering, all you Republicans that talk about how bad Jimmy Carter was, Jimmy Carter left office with a 44% approval rating, which is twice as much as George W. Bush. So Jeb Bush, I'd say pretty much, said, uh, you, uh, I don't think you want to be president. You say you want to give all the illegal aliens amnesty, and you know no Tea Party guy is going to vote for you for that. And now you say your brother was a great president, so uh, goodbye, Jeb. You're a moron. All right. Now, the other guy that's uh, making some noise is this cat named Scott Walker, and uh, Scott is the governor from uh, Wisconsin. You heard about this guy, Al? Scott? Yeah, he's uh, kind of becoming a front runner, but there's one problem with Scott Walker. The guy does not have a college degree. Now, the last president we had that didn't have a college degree was old give him hell Harry Truman back in the 40s and 50s. And, of course, we know Harry is the one that nuked all those Japanese people over there uh, during World War II. Now, I don't know if it's going to be a big problem or not, but I'll tell you what. All you Republican people that made a big deal about the fact that Barack Obama was a community organizer, he wasn't qualified, well, this guy does have a, a law degree from Harvard. So you know what kind of people don't have college degrees? I don't have a college degree. So how would you like for me to be president? I don't think you'd like it very much. So, Mr. Walker, if I was you, I'd find time to get a college education, or better yet, just get one of those uh, universities to give you an honorary doctorate or whatever the hell it is that they do. Now, we got a brand-new show on the uh, American Hearts Radio Network. It's called Possum Politics, and it is hosted by a guy named Ed Carnival, Carnival, excuse me. And Ed, I want to welcome you to the network. Um, Possum Politics is a Republican conservative talk show. Uh, Ed worked on the uh, campaign for Mitt Romney. And as you can expect, um, I disagree with everything Ed says and everything Ed thinks. I was watching his show the other night, and Ed said that it's been rough for him the last six years. Well, let me tell you why it's been rough for you, Ed. It's because we had eight years of George W. Dumbass before the last six years. That's exactly why. And, of course, he did what all good Republicans does. He mentioned Ronald Reagan. For crying out loud, this guy has not been president for 27 goddamn years, man. Would you people give it a rest? Then he went on to say how we really kicked ass when Reagan was in office. Well, if you do your research there, Ed, you'll find out that only the rich people really kicked ass in the 80s, and the rest of us were getting the shaft. If you want to know when we really kicked ass, it was in 1992 when old Bill Get Up Off Your Knees Monica Lewinsky Clinton was president, and we experienced the biggest peacetime economic boom in United States history. But you guys don't ever want to talk about that. I mean, it wasn't even close. 
Now, you okay over there, Al? <laughs> now, on Sunday morning, this past Sunday morning, I was a little bit bored, and what I do on Sundays is, is I channel surf for TV evangelists that are saying something really crazy on TV. And I came across this, uh, you've heard me talk about John Hagee at the Cornerstone Cult in San Antonio, Texas. Well, this other church happens to be in Texas, too. No surprise there. Guy's name is Larry Hutch and his wife, Tiss Hutch. Now, their shit is this. They sit at a table like this, and Larry runs his mouth nonstop. And the whole time, Tiss sits beside him with her smiley, blonde, blonde-headed face, and she says, that's right, uh-huh, yeah, wow. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, man, we can't wait. And it just goes on and on like that for about 30 minutes. Then they try to sell some stuff, which is what all TV ministries do. Now, the funny thing is, though, is I went to their website, and the first thing you see on their website is, is it gives you instructions how you make sure that your donation to them is tax deductible. I think that's awful nice of them to say that out. And then later on down on the website, it says nothing can be redistributed or reissued that you buy on this website. So basically what that means is this. Uh, Janet out in uh, Beaumont, Texas, if you buy a CD from Larry Hutch Ministries and you want to share it with the women at the Bridge Club and you decide to make copies of it, well, guess what? You're going to go to jail because they really want to spread the gospel. Well, by God, if it's got Larry and Tiz's name on it, they got to get paid for it. Now, that's right. That's right. Okay. So, uh, you okay over there, Al? I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and uh, we've got Andy Brown from the Night Porters here tonight, and we'll be right back. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Massey from the Chris Massey Show. You know, one of my favorite places to hang out, eat, and play music is the Moonshot Tavern in Tucker, Georgia. Moonshot Tavern, they got great food, great drink, and great live music five nights a week. Right now at the Moon Shadow Saloon, you can go and get five appetizers for five bucks, five bucks each. That's right, five appetizers for twenty-five dollars. So just go down there and get them. Hell, those appetizers, man, that's a whole meal in itself. mentioned when I was talking about uh, Larry and Tiz Hutch that uh, Larry was explaining the other night on his uh, or the other morning on his show that uh, what happened to America in 2008 was was when people are so blessed by God and become so prosperous well they forget that God is the reason that they become prosperous and when this happens it gives a chance for the devil to slide right in those cracks and make his presence known and according to old Larry that is what happened. 2008, when the economic uh, collapse happened, the devil had gotten into America because we thought we were responsible for our prosperity and caused the crash. Now, I've got to tell you, I have had a lot of people tell me that George Bush had nothing to do with the crash, and I'm happy to finally found out that it was the devil himself that caused the economic crash in 2008. So you people out there, be sure to send this clown some money. That's all i got to say about that. So... Uh, got some announcements here on Saturday, February the 28th, the Chris Massey Band. We'll be at Smith's Old Bar. We're going to be in the Atlanta room. We're headlining a great show. Uh, Buck 05, a fine Atlanta country band, is going to be opening up the show, followed by Jeff Ferris and the Wheels from Nashville, Tennessee. We'll be coming on after that. Cover charge is $8. I think we'll get on stage about 11.15. So please make plans to uh, come out and see that. Also, this Friday night at Smith's Old Bar, my good friend and friend of the show, Alexis Veer, will be performing at Smith's Old Bar. Be sure to check her out as well. On Friday, March 27th, the Chris Massey Band will be returning to the Whistle Post in Conyers, Georgia, one of our favorite places to play. Come on out and see us there. And just then, just on May the 2nd, the uh, Chris Massey Band will be having the Chris Massey CD release party at the Moon Shadow Tavern. My new album, Tuckerville, will finally be coming out. We will be doing the show with the downtown executives, and American Hearts Radio is going to be there. We are going to have a live broadcast of the show here on the American Hearts Radio Network, 
a worldwide broadcast, which means that if you know anybody in Japan, they can watch the show. All right, when we come back, Andy Brown, we'll be right back. Calvary Gutter Services, LLC, provides quality service to our customers. We are committed to excellence and offer a two-year warranty on all workmanship and a lifetime clog-free warranty on all gutter cover systems. We are fully insured for your protection. We are experts in copper and half-round gutter systems, which are offered in sizes ranging from 6 inches to 8 inches. Full soffit and fascia systems can be replaced as we install gutters to avoid wood rot and ensure a job well done. We proudly offer Magnolia Underdeck Systems. We ensure that you are happy with the service we provide. If you need a pro, call us. 678-389-7945. That's 678-389-7945. Calvary Gutter Services. Find us on the web at www.gutteratlanta.org. All right, we're back. Back in the uh, early and mid-80s, my guest tonight had one of the hottest bands in town, the Night Porters. They were headliners down at the 688, play, uh, also shared the stage with bands like The Clash, R.E.M., and The Replacements. And this past weekend, they did a big benefit over at the Star Bar with the driving, with driving and Crying. It was a big show. A lot of people were there. heard a lot of good things about it. Would you please welcome to the Chris Massey Show, Mr. Andy Brown. Come on in, Mr. Brown. Good to be here. Thanks yeah, so much for having me. We finally got you on the show. We've been trying to do this uh, since last August. And I finally got you here, and I'm glad you could make it out on this rainy night in Lake. Okay, so Mr. Brown, I was talking to you, and you told me that you were actually born in England. We spent the uh, first eight years of my life in Birmingham. Okay. That's in the Midlands, and uh, I was born in Miami, and we scooted over there really quick right after that. Okay. So my parents are both from there. Okay, so. great. All right, and uh, you uh, started um, you started playing the guitar when. Uh, when you were about uh, 14, is that 14, right? yeah, 14. Both my brothers played, and they were a huge influence on me putting it together and seeing how it works. Okay, and your brother Dean uh, played guitar in one of the legendary bands in Atlanta, The Restraints. He was a restraint for quite a while. Okay, and he was playing with The Restraints um, in the early punk and new wave days in the late 70s, right? I believe my brother was 17 when his first professional gig was opening for The Clash he did Vora. Wow, okay, and that, that's like in 79... And uh, and I think uh, and I was actually saw your brother because I was a senior in high school and I was there at the Agora in '79 for the Ramones Road to Ruin tour. I was there and I think the Restraints also did a show with Iggy Pop uh, at the Agora. Correct. But back back in those days. Okay, so uh, so when you're 15 years old, you get together with some guys and you uh, form a band called the Night Porters. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, and uh, you told me before that you were uh, you guys were kind of influenced by the Clash and uh. Other bands of that of uh, of that type during that era is that right? A lot of English bands. A lot of English bands. Uh, the Jam, the Clash. Right. You know, Stones, obviously. And, sure. Uh, yeah. You know, um, a lot of American blues also. Uh -huh. Going back to Elmore James and and uh, Johnny Hooker, and okay. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, you know, we that whole English, uh, the Stones and Faces and right. You know, those those uh, mod bands. Yeah. Right kind of what uh, kind of what I would kind of phrase. That's kind of a. It's kind of sloppy rock and roll, a little, a little, a, Just a bit, a, 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 little Just bit, a bit, yeah, a little bit, yeah, you know. Okay, all right, and uh, so uh, by 1982, you guys are, uh, you guys, you told me your first gig was at the 688 with the Restraints. The Restraints had us open on a Wednesday night, and uh, we were 15 at the time. We went through a slew of drummers, uh -huh. and we eventually settled on Paul Lins, okay, who happens to be our who's going to be uh, up here with us later on, right? Okay, um, so. That was a three-piece. Uh, that was our first gig, the three-piece. I was singing and playing guitar. Our guitar player, Ray Diafco, was playing bass, and then Richie Neesmith was playing drums. That was the Night Porter's first kind of comprehensive gig. Okay, now by 1984, uh, you guys are headlining 688 on the weekends. Is that right? Correct. Draw, drawing big crowds. And I know, I think I told you this before, but in, uh, in 1984, the mistakes were done. I decided that I wanted to uh, move on musically, and I had formed kind of a rhythm and blues band called the Moonlighters, and uh, Steve May calls me up one day, and he says, look, the Night Porters are playing down here, and we need somebody to open up the team show. Would you mind, guys, mind coming down here? It was on the last minute, and uh, we came down there, and that was actually the first time I met you guys. Okay. Long, long time ago. Were we ago. nice, or were we like uh, attitudes? Were I think attitude? one of your guitar players uh, stole our guitar tuner, not you, but the other guy. 
We'll have to talk to him about that. <laughs> 30, 20 years it was, later. It was, an old banana, it was an old banana tuner, you know. And uh, I remember my, my guitar player said, uh, you know, I loaned that guy my tuner, man, and uh, he said he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> we'll have to go through our inventory and try to cop that up for you. <laughs> but... but uh, but anyway, so uh, so the night porters roll along, and you guys do some big things. You play with you go on the road with the replacements, uh, play with REM, play with the Clash. I, I know I know I'm missing some bands. I mean, you guys went out on the road for some exp uh, extended periods of time. We right? did. We did uh, the Northeast and New York and Boston's and uh, over to Cincinnati's and uh, Louisville. Like you know, the whole kind of we did four weeks, six weeks here and there. Right. We did a lot of gigs with local bands. Mm. Swimple Q's, The Roy's, sure. OK, and, um, you know, those bands at the time that were very high. OK. And we, who kind of, we cut our teeth, like you said, at 688, and they helped us shape and form okay. our business, per se. All right. Now, tell me about, did you guys get some record offers? We had um, two or three, uh, kind of, at the time, they were not majors. Mm -hmm. Majors, kind of, we talked to a bit. Um, I remember being in a major office in New York, and... Uh, we walked in and the guy's like, what do you got for me? And it was not records that he wanted. So we kind of got tuned out of that whole um, commercial aspect. I don't think right. we had the right hair at that time. It wasn't well, hair in the mid-80s was very important. Yeah, people talk to me about the 80s and I, and yeah. I, 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 that wasn't ours. Our, mine was about Peter Buck's guitar and um, the replacements. Kind yeah, of let me tell you what, those people that owned Dippity Doo after the 80s, they were able to retire. I mean, I mean, they were in white rain hairspray. That, that was real big, you know, and that kind of thing. So the uh, the Night Porters run their course and ended in about 1986. Is that right? That's right. And uh, your drummer Paul went on to. Uh, that's when he left to go play with Driving Crash. Correct. Okay. All right. So uh, so tell me what uh, what Andy Brown does in uh in, well, once the Night Porters split up. Um, well, he played in a couple other bands, but he's doing a lot of demos with Peter Bach. Okay. And he's doing different recordings with different people and. Um, you know, things when you have a band that works like that, it's kind of tough to get your teeth back in the game, you know? Sure. So you're yeah. kind of working more, you're concentrating more on songwriting, per se, I right. think, you know? And uh, finding what works, what doesn't, and really maybe becoming more of a human. I got you. I got you. Yeah, um, now let me ask you something as far as a songwriter, because I'm a songwriter myself. Are you a... Uh when, you, when you're writing songs, I, I know for me, uh, uh, most of the time when I'm writing, um, the lyrics and the melody come to me first. And then I just basically sit down with the guitar and I just chord out what I'm singing. And I let the melody write the chord progressions. I mean, that that's that's usually how it works for me. And that's a good thing because I am not a very good guitar player. I mean, you know, so that, that works real well with me. How do you approach it when you go at it's it? It's probably the opposite with me. I'll start with some suspended chords and, and, and get that melody going and uh -huh. then train of like that stream of consciousness. Okay. Let that flow. And... Nine times out of ten, whatever you start with, you'll work it way down, and you'll come back to where you started to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Anyway, exactly. You know, so. Yeah. 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 I, I found. It. I and I had a very interesting experience. This. Uh, you know, I've been working on this record. This record has taken uh, a lot longer than my first re first two records, mainly uh, budget for one, right. and two because I've had the TV show and we went on the road last summer. And when I'm working on a new record, it's impossible for me to write. You know, I'm so focused on what I'm recording and. And uh, but this has been a long time. So Saturday night, I sat down. I said, "God damn it, I'm going to write a song, and we're going to write one." And I wrote one, and and it sounded pretty good when I wrote it Saturday night. And when I got up Sunday morning and played the recording back, it really wasn't that good. But I did complete it. You know, verse, chorus, bridge. You know, the whole deal. And then Sunday, I was able to write what I considered a good song, a song that would have made the cut for my new album. And that's the first one that I'd done for a long time, and it was almost like it was almost like a sigh of relief, you know, man, I can still I can still do it. Because sometimes I'll get into uh, droughts, and I'll listen to my albums, and I'll say, man, I can't believe I wrote all those songs. I can't come up with a nursery rhyme right now. I think it's important, no matter what you do, to just write because you're going seventy percent of what you do is just going to be that throwaway. That's right. So that you get to the to get to the heat, the meat and potatoes, you got to get to the thirty percent. That's you right. Out of sort of. Keep working, keep getting it through, and, and break it out. Right, you know? So. right. You know, and, and one of the and one of the things, and I'm sure you're this way, is uh, one of the things that songwriting. It's not just about writing songs. It's about able to look at your stuff and objectively go, "This stinks." Correct. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, or this is really good. This is really good. Right. You know, and when it's really good, you're really excited. You can't wait for the band to hear it. 
you know, you're already hearing it in the studio, how you want to record it, instrumentation, all, all that kind of stuff. And I, and I think that gets back to, like, when it's good, you're going to get feedback immediately, whether it's a demo, whether it's just you singing it, somebody's going to say that right, right there is what it is. And yeah. when you start hearing more and more people saying that, you kind of know you're on to something. There, That's true. You know? That's so. true. All right, so uh, sometime during this period, uh, you get married. Is that correct? When did you get married? That was a little bit later. Okay. I was a late bloomer in that field. Okay. What um, year did you get married? Uh, 2005. 2005. Okay. Yeah. So when you got married, you'd already started doing the solo thing with the Andy Brown yeah. trio. Is yeah. that right? I was working up in uh, I was working up in Philadelphia, and um, you know, during the recession, things got slower. Right. And it got me back into music because uh, I had taken a break working around the world doing these video mm -hmm. production, etc. But um, yeah, I mean, it's we've had uh, up in Philadelphia. I've had the Andy Brown trio. That's sort of been working since 2004. We worked for maybe six good years. Did two, two or three CDs. Okay. Played a lot of music festivals up there and music conferences. Okay. And that was working really well. Um, and then now we've got a diff couple of different projects going on in the studio. Okay. And um, I'm working with the Andy Brown Troupe in Atlanta. Okay. Great. Which is again with my brother Dean. Right. Dean Brown, Pito Monaguda, who was also a restraint on oh. drums. Okay. Johnny Hibbert. Johnny Hibbert, good friend of mine. Yeah. John Daly. John Daly, just like I told you, he just did some uh, steel guitar on my new record. Just sent me some tracks the other day, as a matter of fact. He is awesome. And mm -hmm. uh, Frank French is producing. Okay. Uh, Frank French has his studio in his house. Frank um, originally came down with Kevin Kenny from Driving a Crime. He was one of the originators of that band. Okay. And um, he became a producer doing the Indigo Girls okay. and uh, different local bands. And he's, he's done quite well for himself, actually. Excellent. Very interesting character he is, okay. Frank. Tell you what, we're going to take a quick break from Scott Dale Metal. When we come back, we're going to bring Paul Lenz up. So we'll be right back. Scott Dale Metal Products, your family owned and operated gutter supply house since 1971. Wholesale prices are available to the public and we offer worldwide shipping. See our full catalog gutters and coil, downspout, elbows, end caps and miters, outlets, debris protection, hangers K style, hangers half round, and many other accessories. Look us up on the web at scottdalemetal.net. That's scottdalemetal.net. Give us a call at 770-922-1330. That's 770-922-1330. Scottdale Metal Products, Incorporated. 1520 Parker Road, Southeast, Conyers, Georgia, 30094. Scottdale Metal Products is a proud sponsor of the Chris Massey Web TV Music Show on AmericanHearsRadio.com. All right, we're back. We're back. And Mr. Brown was so uh, good to bring along with him, uh, the guy that played drums with the Night Porters and played with early, uh, the early days of driving and crying. Would you please welcome to the Chris Massey Show, Mr. Paul Lenz. Come on up, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Very good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks sir. for coming. Good now, I think it's really you. cool that, uh, you know, you guys played so long ago and are, uh, are still friends. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't, and, and, and that's how it is with the guys and the mistakes. Right. You know, we, we did a reunion show here in December and, and we, uh, we don't get together often, but when we do, it's, it's always good. It's always good. So, um, so tell me now, um, when, when Paul left the Night Porters to go with the Driving Crying, is that why the band split, or was there, or were you guys already getting close to the end anyway? Well, we we just different situations arose, and it just we had a really good chemistry, but this happened and that happened, and we actually when Paul and Tim left, we continued on for a bit with uh, a couple of different people, and you know it was okay, but there's a certain chemistry that works, right? And we that's what we. Um, Knew what we were missing. Okay. So, you know. Now, Paul, you played on the uh, Scarbert Smarter album, right? Correct. Okay. Now, when I had a six, uh, when I did the six eighty eight show, and I had Steve May on here, mm -hmm. he just went on and on about what a great record that was. Oh, yeah. And um, now, and he was telling me that uh, that you know, uh, now you, they signed a deal with six eighty eight records. Is that correct? True. Okay. Now he was telling me that he had always wanted Kevin to go in the direction of more of a, a folk type. Uh, sound, yeah. kind of like on that song, um, uh, going straight to hell. Yeah. And that was the sound that that he wouldn't have, uh, if he would have been in charge, he wouldn't have made the band more like of a power pop rock band, which yeah. I guess is uh, certainly more power than pop. I always thought. Yeah. But um, so uh, so how, how did that come about? Was there any? Was there ever any change in the music once you guys started making records, or did it kind of stay the same? No, it was definitely there was all kind of changes. Uh, 
Yeah, it's hard to explain. The originally and the, and the song, the band's name, Driving and Crying, was actually a song titled Driving and Crying, which was a song about that Kevin had written about moving from Milwaukee to uh, Atlanta. Okay. And uh, it, I mean, it was it was not a fun trip. He and his wife, you know, spent the night in the back seat in the parking lots and uh, right. they had you know flat tires and no spare, and that was that kind of a trip. So they were driving and they were crying. Yeah, and Steve, then, uh, Steve May told me you should lay him sleep at the 688 all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I also slept at 688 quite often because I lived in the suburbs and sometimes it was late. Right. But, uh, yeah, um, I had actually, uh, I had made a little bedroom above the opening uh, dressing room for opening bands. Oh, okay. Had a little mattress up there, had a little rope ladder. Hey, I never saw that. No, no, only, <laughs> only my good friends got to see that. <laughs> <laughs> no, only my cute friends are like that. But, uh, yeah, um, but anyway, no, that, so, yeah, when we started, when Driving and Crying first started playing, we had Kevin's acoustic side and we had the power trio. Because basically, when Tim and Kevin and I first got together, we started playing. If we did anything that sounded like remotely like the blues, it ended up sounding kind of like Led Zeppelin trying to play the blues. Gotcha. And uh, so that was kind of cool. And then but Kevin did have, you know, his acoustic. Right. Side and his Bob Dylan esque stuff. Yes. That was, and I think that it was a good idea to try to develop that part of him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and then, um, of course, they went on and got, you know, we got signed by a major label and then, uh, uh, you know, Island picked us up and then dumped us just as fast and then, uh, you know, they got ended up with Geffen and they had different A&R people trying to push Kevin in different directions and then, you know, they, they became a metal band for a minute, I think, when they put Smoke out. That was kind of... Right. I never understood any of that stuff. Right. And I was actually, of course, the reason I left Driving Crime was because I was an idiot and did a lot of stupid stuff all the time, but I told people it's because I had artistic differences. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, oh yeah, these guys are selling out, you know, I have to go. Uh, you know, I forgot to mention that. Well, that's uh, one of the definitions yeah. for, arti for artistic differences, you can't follow the rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't following yeah. anybody's rules back then. That yeah, well, I had some problems, uh, you know, when I, when I was in the mistakes with uh, Froggy before he joined the Roys. Uh, Froggy, oh, Froggy. Froggy, Froggy was pretty big on, uh, on, uh, on uh, you know, marching to his own beat, you know. Mm -hmm. Which, and a lot of times, it, it was right, and uh, I know uh, Peter and Alan, have, when, when they formed the Roys, you know, he had to, he had to stand in line and, uh, and uh, follow, the, follow their steps. And, yeah. uh, well, and he did a great job. They were one of my favorite bands of all time, yeah, you know. Okay. Peter V., if you're watching tonight... <laughs> Man, I'm waiting on you, buddy. We really need to get you on the show. Oh, so we can get Peter Vee in here. So yeah. You too, yeah. But uh, well, so, I've seen a few front sunrises with Froggy does. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, most everybody in Atlanta has seen a sunrise house. Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. Now, um, uh, so tell me about, um, uh, so how long were you with Driving and Crime? Uh, I don't even know the time. I'm really bad about that kind of stuff. I'll bury But uh, I'd say, you know, three, four years. To three, four years? Yeah. Um, we, we did Scarbit Smarter, and then we, we were in the middle of production of uh, Whisper Tains Line, the album. Uh, and then uh, that's that was when I decided to, you know, depart the situation. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that was, um, I'm going to say two and a half, three years probably. But okay. we, played, we played an awful lot, uh, did a lot of shows around here, did a lot of shows on the road. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's funny when people say, like, you know, oh, you're, you were in Driving and Crying. No, I was in Driving and Crying for... The first two and a half years of their existence and their career is thirty years old. So it's yeah, like, wow, that's hard know, to believe it, that, yeah. it, that, that it's been and thirty then, years. And it's one of the things like that the, the album, the, the CD or whatever, Scarlet Smarter Well was released on vinyl, so it was an album. Uh, you know, wasn't was an important thing for that band, but people still remember it. And and uh, you know, we got together and played it night, last night, um, and that was pretty damn cool. And it still rocks. And uh, I think I think it was, you know, it's a whole. It's kind of funny. And Kevin gets kick out of it because it's like he gets to go back in time. And do that stuff because there's no he couldn't do it with anybody else. And, right. You know, okay. so it's kind of cool. We were talking about that last night. Well, and they're and they're one of those bands that that can say you know um, somewhere on this planet every day on a radio station a driving crime song gets played. Mm -hmm. And man, uh, and uh, and that's it. You know right. that, that 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 that's what it's all about leaving leaving a legacy like that. Yeah. So uh, so Andy, what's uh, what's on the horizon for you right now? We're in, uh, as I said, we're recording right now at Frank French's here. Okay. We just did uh, three days during the day as we were practicing with the porters at night. And uh, and I'm also recording at Skylab Studios in New Jersey. Okay. Different projects. Cool. So um, all right. it's all about writing the songs right now. I got you. I got you. And Paul, how about you, man? I I uh, played drums last night. Might not pick up sticks for six months or a year. Who knows? <laughs> I, uh, I work for a living. I'm a video engineer. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Cool. So... But, you know, uh, I did get a lot of last night people telling me, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, the porters need to play out, and I, that, I would welcome that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all in a place in our personal lives and our professional lives where, 
you know, I would love to still pick up the sticks and play the drums, but somebody is going to have to pay me some money. That's and, right. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, well so, good luck with that. Yeah, I, I that's can, what I'm I, saying. I, I can, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sending out anything. a shout out to Cameron. My seven-year-old and Everly, my two-and-a-half-year-old. Yeah, They've been okay. missing me. I've been right. here. And I, I've, I've enjoyed my trip because, you know, I got to talk to men. Right. Uh, there's a lot of estrogen going on in my house, which I think you know, too, <laughs> yeah. right? I do, yeah. Yes, so it's been quite a pleasurable four days here. I've seen all my old buddies. But, uh, yeah, I don't. how do you handle that, my friend? Well, uh, you know, I just stay quiet. That's <laughs> the key, I guess, yes. <laughs> Then you've got your show, and you can be loud, I, I right? I just stay quiet and admit, and admit when I'm wrong, and I uh, try not to. Uh, I mean, you know, my my wife, bless her heart. I mean, look, she gets to she has to live with uh, Chris Massey and the Chris Massey band, uh, Chris Massey business owner, uh, Chris Massey and the Chris Massey show. And this is true, you know. When I came in, I told her, I said, you know, I got this call from American Hearts Radio, and they're going to give me a talk show on Web TV. And she said, great. Just one more damn reason for you to think about yourself. That's what you that's what we need in this house right now. That's right. You know, she didn't really believe me until she saw the first episode. You know, but, but anyway, well, look, it was great having you Thank guys. Thank you very on much here. for having us. And Appreciate I hope it. to uh, do some work with you at that festival in Grant Park. Sounds later great. On this year. Paul, great to see that. you, man. See All right, you. we'll be right back. It's Leon Smoker with Rachel Jordan. Networks make me go to this Kiss concert with you. Well, you know, man, sometimes I uh, I get lost. You know, I have a hard time getting found. Where did you even find this car? You know that dude that does the uh, Batman show at 11 a.m. on Saturdays? Oh, yeah, so we let you borrow it? Well, sort of. What do you mean, sort of? Well, I mean, my car broke down and I kind of sort of took his. Well, did you ask him for permission? No. So you stole it? Well, man, look, it's not really stealing, man. We're going to give it back to him after we get back from the concert. It's unbelievable. Now, look, man, when we get to the concert, I've got some weed in the glove box there, man, and I want you to put it in your purse and take it in the concert for me. Have you lost your mind? Oh, shit. What? Oh, man, it's the cops, man. Quick, get that weed out, man, and shove it down your pants. I'm not shoving weed down my pants. Oh, shit, here he comes. Play cool, play cool. Hello, sir. Hello, officer. Listen, man, if you pull us over because you think we've got marijuana in this car, we don't have any in here. You were speeding? Yeah. Are you Leon Smoker? Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm Leon Smoker. Yeah, that's right, man. And this is Rachel Jordan. I've seen both your shows. Hi, officer. Man, you need to do a yeah. Black Sabbath review. So you'd like to, see us do a, uh, like to see us do a review of a Black Sabbath record, huh? You can go. Slow it down. Okay. All right, man. Well, listen, man, I really appreciate it. Man, that was close. You're an idiot. The officers require assistance. I just want to celebrate another day of living. I just want to celebrate another day of life. Oh. All right, we're back. We're back. Okay, for being a guest on the Chris Massey Show, Andy Brown and Paul Lenz will both receive a six-month supply of Rasseroni, the San Francisco treat, and a case of turtle wax. Just see Ray, the security guard, down in the lobby, and he will get you your door prices. Uh, people ask me all the time, Al, what is a six-month supply of Rasseroni? It's 180 boxes. And that's enough sodium to put you in the grave, my friend. So you might want to share it with your friends and family. We are not responsible for what happens to you for eating it. Or if this turtle wax screws up the paint on your car. All right. So uh, let's see, Al. We got a, oh, look at here. Look at what Leon Smoker, Leon Smoker sent me this bottle of Jack Daniels because uh, Leon wants to get his own show. Uh, Leon, I have nothing to do with uh, getting you your own show, but I appreciate the Jack Daniels. All right, so next Tuesday, February 24th, right here on the Chris Massey Web TV Show, we will have Moses Moe, lead guitar player for Mother's Finest, is going to be here 
for the entirety of the program. This is a guy that I went and saw play at uh, places like Bobby Dodd Stadium in 1978 and 1979 at the Champagne Jams. I saw him at the Omni one night when they goddamn blew Aerosmith off the stage. Man, let me tell you what, Stephen Tyler wished he would not have shown up that night. Well, really, he didn't show up. So anyway. All right, uh, Al, good job as always. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, thanks to Michael Loye and Bruce uh, in Jacksonville. And Ed of Pasta Politics, and I didn't mean to tick you off, man, but when you're on TV saying a bunch of stuff that ain't right, man, somebody's got to call you out on it. Anyway, like I always say, always love your woman, take life as it comes, and when you get the chance, have too much fun. We'll see you next time. Yeah.